Professor Michael Kimmage, Professor of History at uh, the Catholic University of America and a senior non-resident uh, fellow at uh, CSIS, the Center for Strategic and International Studies in, uh, in Washington. Uh, and I'd like to begin this introduction this morning uh, with a personal reminiscence of the first time I encountered Professor SUNY, which he may or may not remember as an event. Uh, and this was either in the fall of 1990 or the spring of 1991, when I was a prospective student at Swarthmore College. And as part of the program, we went to see a lecture uh, by uh, a visiting professor. And I've forgotten many of the lectures that I've attended in graduate school and as an undergraduate, but I didn't forget this particular one. Uh, you know, I can't exactly remember the topic, but uh, uh, it left a, a, a deep impression uh, from the learning uh, and erudition uh, on display. I also learned the term, I don't think that you used it, but it came up in the question and answer period, of a radish professor, uh, somebody who's red on the outside uh, and white on the inside. I don't think that this accusation was levied at you, Professor Suni, but the term uh, came up and also sort of stuck in my memory of uh, this event now um, 32 years uh, in the past. And to mention that uh, sweep of time is to, I think, begin uh, the introduction to the very distinguished speaker that we have uh, with us this morning, uh, whose official honorific is the William H. Sewell, Jr. Distinguished University Professor Emeritus at the University of Michigan, uh, Ann Arbor. Uh, and I will just mention a couple of the most pertinent uh, publications, uh, and there are many, many more <clears throat> that Professor Suni has uh, compiled, anthologized, written, uh, and published, but I'll just mention a few that I think are especially relevant to this morning's uh, presentation and, and to the next two weeks of events that we have uh, before us. So going in chronological order, uh, Armenia and the 20th century seems pertinent to an event uh, taking place in, uh, in Yerevan. Uh, the making of the Georgian nation, uh, obviously pertinent to where we'll be heading uh, in a couple of days. The Soviet experiment, Russia, the USSR, and the successor states. A history of the Armenian genocide. Uh, a book on the historiography, both of the Russian Revolution and of the Soviet Union. And then more recently, several books that address the life career, legacy, and influence uh, of Joseph Stalin, uh, whose you know, sort of house and museum we'll be visiting toward the end of the symposium's uh, program. So just three very quick points uh, before I turn the floor over to Professor uh, Suni. It seems to me that if you would synthesize very rapidly this uh, very distinguished uh, career and scholarship across many different national uh, and historical borders, uh, you could say that Professor Suni has helped us to understand the construction of the Soviet Union uh, and <clears throat> the many different imperial and national problems that confronted the leaders of the Soviet Union from the 1920s through to the 1980s. Uh, and the Soviet Union wouldn't have been possible to construct had these various peoples, ethnicities, and nations in some form or fashion not been brought together. And at the same time, you know, sort of flipping the coin, the historical coin over to its other side, I think Professor Suni has helped us to understand the implosion or the destruction of the Soviet Union by looking at it at, at many of the same questions I just mentioned a moment ago, the difficulties of constructing an empire and the particular difficulties of constructing this empire uh, given, once again, the many national, uh, ethnic, uh, and sort of peoplehood questions uh, that were there at the beginning and, of course, uh, at the end of the, uh, of the Soviet story. Uh, and the th sort of third point that I would make by way of conclusion for this introduction is that, you know, sort of looking at the present moment, which I don't think historians are obligated to do, but it's, it's, it's often interesting uh, and illuminating that this question of construction and destruction along either imperial or national lines is not a question that we can consign to the past, but is urgently a question related to the present. I think it has its Armenian dimension, it has its Georgian dimension, it has its Ukrainian dimension, it has its Russian dimension. You can sort of go through all of the successor states to the Soviet Union and look at these questions uh, in that light. And so it's with that in mind that it gives me really great pleasure to turn the floor over to Professor Suni. Uh, and um, he'll speak for roughly 45 minutes and then we'll all have the chance to begin a conversation and to ask questions. So Professor Suni, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Michael. Varevdzes, dilit mishvidobisa, 
Dobrije utro. Those are the three languages that we're going to be dealing with in this uh, symposium. It's really a great pleasure to be here. I thank Anna Vasilieva for inviting me to be here and to give this uh, sort of keynote address. Let me begin by saying that it's very strange that it was precisely at the moment of the demise of the great overseas empires and the collapse of the largest land empire in the world, the Soviet Union, that scholars began to re-engage the problematic of imperialism. So empire, sometime in the 1990s, paradoxically became the intellectual flavor of the month. As the United States, of course, confidently proclaimed its right, now that there was no Soviet Union, to global hegemony, preventive war, and preemption, raising the specter of new forms of empire that confound conventional definitions. So its major adversary, the Soviet Union, uh, was now gone, and the United States was no longer constrained in its in international ambitions. And the successor states of the former Soviet Union, Russia included, now found themselves living in a much more vulnerable world dominated by a single hyper power. So the question that I'm going to ask today and look at is where have the past and present practices of empire, particularly as affects the region we're sitting in, the South Caucasus, left Russia, Armenia, Georgia, Azerbaijan, and others. We've watched as the Russian Federation made a transition from not only authoritarianism to democracy, but back again to a new form of, of authoritarianism, and maybe to a new form of empire. So that's the basic theme that I want to discuss. I'm going to begin with um, a constructivist approach to international relations. I'm going to argue that foreign policy is not merely a product of geographical and historically determined imperatives or opportunities. It's not located, foreign policy, uh, in the differential in power among states, though that's important, but is more determined by perceptions, ideas, and identities that are articulated in something that's called national interests. National interests are supposed to be defended and promoted in the international arena. I'm going to argue that an identification as an empire has effects on perceived interests that differ from identification of a country as a nation state. So I'm going to talk about the difference, as I understand it, between empires and nation states. And I will think, I will try to argue, and we can talk and argue about this, that states will act on the basis of their perceived interests, but conceptions of what kind of a state you are, its historical purposes and operative belief systems, as well as the larger discursive universe in which it operates, these are all fundamental uh, to the construction of those interests. Let me start by saying, because Russia is at the center of our attention, that I would argue that there are six factors that help to explain the foreign policy of Russia and the Soviet Union in light of its historical experience. Now, I'm not arguing that there's some kind of essential Russianness or quality of Russia that determines this, but I think there are constants that have to be considered. First of all, Russian and Soviet, and now Russian again, foreign policy, in my 55 years of teaching Russian and Soviet history, I would argue, with few exceptions, brief exceptions, they exist, have been principally guided by its leaders' perception of weakness and insecurity 
vis-a-vis its international and nearby competitors. So if some states are described as security states, I would say Russia and even the Soviet Union, the second most powerful country on the globe at the time, are insecurity states. They're worried about weakness. A second major factor among the most fundamental sources of that weakness are Russia's size and place within the international order. Russia is simply too big. By its very existence and size, it presents security concerns to other countries. They don't know what to do with this Russia, particularly countries like the Baltic states or Poland and so forth. Uh, This size and place within the international order is compounded by a lack of clearly defined borders. It's not like the United States. The United States is a funny country because it has a weak neighbor to the north. Well, there was an occasion in 1812 when we thought we could take some of Canada, and we even won a battle on Lake Erie, but we didn't go much further. It's not so much like a weak country to the north and a weak country to the south. Mexico, we took about half of Mexico, you know, California and all that, but you know, we stopped at a certain point of doing that. Uh, And so it's weak neighbor to the north, weak neighbor to the south for the United States, and fish on both coasts. So this is a French uh, a diplomat men- mentioned it this way. So there's not much, much insecurity based on ge- geography. It's different for Russia because there's, uh, there's no natural boundaries, mountains, seas, except by the time you get to the Pacific. There's also in Russia, besides this great size, this is all one, this is all second point, low population density. Right? It's an underpopulated country, and it's getting more underpopulated. And for much of its history, and even to the present time, what you could call a relatively under-articulated, under-constructed social and communications infrastructure. Okay? It's hard to get around Russia. The third thing, and Michael has already mentioned this, is Russia is a multinational state, and certainly the Soviet Union was. And imagine this, the Soviet Union was more non-Russian than Russian for much of its history. This multinational state had an imperial history, and I'm gonna argue that the Soviet Union was also an empire, not just Tsarist Russia. And as a result of its imperial history and its multinationality, this is a very important point, Russia has produced a fragile, fragmented national identity. Russia has not been a very, a nation state with what you might call high nationness, like the United States, or by the way, like Armenia. In Armenia, we've got a very high sense of who we are and who we are not, and also being probably the best country in the world. That's normally Armenia. I'm Armenian, by the way, born in America, but, but, you know, you can't get rid of, of being an Armenian if you're an Armenian. So uh, this fragmented national identity, this weakness of who they are that persists to the present time, and think of all the efforts that Putin is making uh, to try to generate a new sense of national coherence. Always good to have a good war and an enemy if you want to create a good sense of national coherence. Uh, this has produced consequences for its own understanding and generation of what its national interests are, because identities and interests are connected. The structure and ideology of empire, as well as the costs and constraints of an imperial system, contributed, I would argue, in much of Russia's history to a lack of dynamism uh, and coherence Uh, and resistance to reform. That was just number three. The fourth one is that although Russia's leaders have often thought, like leaders in many countries, in what's known as international relations realism terms, right? It's all about power and defending yourself against others. Although they often have thought in realist terms, their actual self-conceptions, that is, their identities, 
their ideas of history and their narratives about the past and future have influenced their perceptions of Russian interests. Think about the war in Ukraine, right? It can be interpreted as a move against Ukraine falling into the Western orbit dominated by the United States, a danger to Russia if it conceives itself in cold realist terms, but also that, it, that, that realism is shaped by understandings of narratives, what's the proper place of Russia in the world, what's the proper relationship of Ukrainians to Russians as one people, all of which are articulated in uh, Putin's own uh, fabricated histories of their relationship. So that's extraordinarily important. Ideology, or in the broad sense, my idea of ideology is a discourse of politics here, rather than simple realpolitik, which of course itself is an ideology, not a description of reality, but of the way people think of reality. That is, realpolitik is not the way the world actually works, it's the way th people think it works. And of course, if enough people think the world operates in realpolitik terms, then it'll act that way, <laughs> and discourse will determine what is the active uh, momentary reality. So uh, this ideology, uh, different ideologies, of course, in Tsarism and the Soviet Union and Russia today, has played in Russian history a motivating and sometimes debilitating role in determining policy. So fifthly, Russia's internal composition, which derived from its long historical formation and its geopolitical location, its lack of frontiers, uh, its enemies seen on all sides, is key to defining its identities and interests. So domestic understandings and concerns determine their foreign policy interests as well. The same is true for most countries, but, but here it's very, very much evident. Um, so, uh, and finally, sixthly, finally, I would say Russia today, as much in, of the past, lives in a dangerous neighborhood. Maybe not as dangerous as Armenia, with enemies and blockades and active opposition on its borders, but a dangerous neighborhood, at least it thinks it does. Both real and perceived dangers have historically uh, contributed to its sense of weakness and insecurity. And the current threats uh, in the recent past include threats from peripheries within the country, we're going to be hearing a lot about the North Caucasus or Chechnya or whatever. From the near abroad, perhaps the spread of Islam, the former Soviet Union, those present things. Definitely the expansion of NATO, that is the creeping increase of power of the West and moving not only closer and closer to the borders, but within the former Soviet Union. And dangers from other great powers as well. So... These are sort of the big concerns, it seems to me, uh, that Russia faces and the way it's trying to understand itself. Now, I promised, actually, that I would talk about empires, and I would talk about empires by contrasting them with the other most important for, uh, political formation in the world, nation states. If I had to generalize, I would say there are three kinds of states in the world. There are empires, there are homogeneous, more or less, nation states, and there are also multinational states, like India, let's say, or Canada or something, Switzerland or something like that. But basically, I'm going to talk about empires on the one hand and nation states on the other. And it seems to me it's important that we be clear about our definitions, because many historians and political scientists even argue you can't define these things clearly because there's too much controversy about the way they're defined. I would begin by a statement that empires and nations pull in different directions. First of all, empires. And this definition is not only descriptive, but if it's a good definition, it should tell you something about which way empires work. <laughs> 
it should tell you something about how, they're, what, how they operate, what their preferences are. Empires are founded, both overseas empires and contiguous landed empires like Russia and the Soviet Union or the Habsburg Empire uh, or the Ottoman Empire or whatever. Uh, empires are founded on principles of institutionalized differences and distinctions both laterally, horizontally, between peoples and geographies and vertically between those on the top and the bottom. Those on the top, the superior classes, uh, are given the right to rule over others, the inferior. And the inferior are condemned then to be ruled by others. So empire is defined by two important things, difference and hierarchy, both of which are institutionalized in law. So the British rule India because they're white and Western and superior in some way, maybe racially, maybe technologically. They have more guns, they have less people, and they rule over hundreds of millions of people somehow. Right? So the superiority of some over others, that's one of the characteristics of empire. And you'll see in a moment how this differs from a nation state. Now note, what I'm arguing is about an ideal type of empire. Maybe none that ha has ever existed purely in history, but as a heuristic term, it helps us see differences between empires and nation states. Heuristic is a wonderful word. All it means is a teaching device. So it's not a fancy dancy word. Don't worry about it. So empires are, are distinguished by uh, these hierarchies and distinctions between some superior and some inferior. And if that's true, then the superiors have to maintain somehow their distinction and their superiority. So a lot of the effort of empires is to maintain that the British are different from the Indians or the aristocrats in Russia are different from ordinary people or that the communist elite, the nomenclatura, is different from non-communists and has the right to rule for some reason by virtue of their superiority or because we're going to civilize you. This is called the mission civilisatrice in French. Isn't French a beautiful language, a really nice language? Everything sounds fancier in French. Or, as Anatoly will show you later, if you say it with a British accent. But I have neither. So, it's very important then for these empires to maintain these distinctions, and they'll do it in a variety of ways. Empires, for instance, don't like uh, people mixing with the superior race, for instance, and they'll legislate in all kinds of ways uh, against that. So, uh, that's important. Now, if empires are based on differences, distinctions, and hierarchies of some superior to others that gives them the right to rule over those inferiors, what are nations or nation states? First nation uh, uh, is a, a very interesting concept that's very often confused and defined in a variety of ways. So here's how I define nation. Nations are imagined and affective, that's a fancy way of saying emotionally constructed, communities. They're, they're imagined and they're effective, affective communities that promote, at least rhetorically, if not always in practice, commonality, homogeneity, horizontal equivalence, and, and all of these things constitute the nation. In other words, the nation is not about difference and hierarchy, but equality. These are not subjects, these are citizens, equal at least under the, war, uh, the law, right? Now we know that people are different, right? Some are taller, some are smaller, some are beautiful, some are lucky to be Armenian, some are not. But they're nevertheless, in, under the law as citizens, we're all supposed to be equal. Uh, and, and supposed to be generally something like Armenians or something like Americans or Belgians or whatever we happen to be. Now, a nation in its inception is very interesting, a modern nation, because the term is used in all kinds of ways in earlier ages. Do you know that nation meant in 
Edward Spencer's fairy, the fairy queen, uh, a flock of birds. I mean, something like that. You wouldn't, or a group of students was a nation in the Middle Ages. This is not what we're talking about. A modern nation is a peculiar kind of political formation. Think about this. In, it's a political claim that if you share a culture of some kind, ethnic, political, religious, whatever, language, if you have a shared culture, you magically have the right to rule yourself. Culture is a claim to politics. And if you share a culture in modern times, this discourse of the nation is a modern concept that you don't find very seriously before the 18th century. If you have a shared culture, ethnically, politically, religiously, whatever, you then have the possibility of sovereignty, statehood, and a claim to a piece of the world's real estate, namely, Rodina, Heidenik, Samshoblo, those are the different words for homeland in the languages we're talking about. So at one end of the political spectrum, you have empires that operate through hierarchy, difference between subjects and rulers. And at the other end of this, this uh, ideal types that I'm, you have nations that function on the basis of equality and shared nature uh, of some kind of equal citizens. Now, in modern times, nations took on, became states, or they would, lots of nations, there are more nations, by the way, in cultural groups than there are states in the world. There are about 200 plus states. But these nations often have aspirations to create themselves as sovereign states based on territory. This is ours, not yours. This is really Armenia, not Western Azerbaijan, as Baku claims, right? Those kinds of things. Now, the, in reality, what you'll find is that the, these things about equality and homogeneity and difference and superiority often overlap and conflict, right? If you think about a state like Armenia, it's highly homogeneous because we basically got rid of the Azerbaijanis at a certain point. They left or we made sure they left by putting them on trucks and sending them to Azerbaijan at a certain point. You won't hear many Armenians tell you that story, by the way. It's all right. Uh, and um, uh, so, so but, it, but in fact, mo many nations have both imperial and national forms within it. And there's conflict often between them. I think of the United States when it was a slaveholding society, when the South had a different form of rulership, was a kind of empire, right? With a superior race, white race, controlling certain kinds of people or driving Indians away. America's a wonderful interesting example of how Europeans came to a continent, dispossessed the local indigenous people, took their land, that's a good way, this is a primitive accumulation of capital, Karl Marx would call it, and also borrowed and brought in and enslaved black people from Africa, so you got free land and free labor, and we became the richest country in the world. Not bad, not many countries can do that. Some tried, Australia, Israel, but you know, in general, it's a hard thing to, to achieve. And yet many nations in the drive for homogeneity uh, and so forth have precisely engaged in things like ethnic cleansing. Armenia is almost 99% Armenian. Uh, and even genocide, like the Ottoman Empire in Anatolia, who murdered uh, about a million Armenians and Assyrians in order to create the modern uh, nation state of Turkey. They still have a problem with uh, about 20% of the population being Kurds, who they uh, are trying to repress and keep down, but, but uh, they'll, that's, that's their problem, not mine. Okay, so there, there are countries and most countries in which imperial tendencies, some wanting to be superior to others and recognizing inequalities conflict with this idea of homogeneity. And a, a good example, I remember once I was teaching this and some people argue that, that uh, empires are always great big states. And then Andrei Sakharov talked about how Georgia was an empire because the Georgians wanted to rule over Abkhaz, Ossetians, Ajars, Armenians, whoever else. And so it had imperial uh, things to it. And one of my students was a Flemish fellow from Belgium. And he said, no, Belgium is an empire. 
Those, you know, Walloons want to conquer and, 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 and dominate us over here. And I had to rethink this thing. Maybe it isn't about vastness. Maybe it's about the relationship, the way these countries are governed. So now the second thing I would mention about mixing these things together is when you look at nationalistic histories, the history of Georgia now, let's say, or Azerbaijan and Armenia, often you will see the history written as a nationalizing history. So there's a kind of dominant narrative, nationalist narrative in histories that we were repressed. We Armenians were here from the, the ancient primeval ooze and the empires, whether it was Sasanian or Ottoman or Russian, repressed us. But somehow we fought and we realized our freedom in modern times. You've heard this, right? Right? You know, Braveheart and Scotland and, you know, remember that Braveheart movie with that famous anti-Semite? Uh, who was the star of the movie. Anyway, um, so that narrative, that nationalist narrative um, is very powerful. And it leaves out empire. And it leaves out the way in which nations often were created and developed within empires, including, by the way, the empires we're studying and looking at, the Tsarist and the Soviet empire. And I, I spent a lot of time writing books about the Caucasus, one on Baku, one on Azerbaijan, one on Georgia, one on Armenia, two are in Armenia. And I've, I've tried to bring this story, the imperial context together with the national development, right? So the standard, um, the standard nationalist view is we were there, we were a nation, but we were, we were repressed, we were like sleeping beauty, waiting to wake up. And finally, in modern times, the kiss of freedom came and the nation developed, right? That's the national story. But this real story is complicated because within the Tsarist empire, nationalities and nations and ethnic groups were beginning to become conscious. And if you look, Armenians from this area, from the South Caucasus, uh, went to Europe or went to St. Petersburg and learned about what was going on in Europe and the French Revolution and the, the new nationalism that was developing. And Georgians went to St. Petersburg or uh, the most famous Ar first Armenian novelist, uh, Abovyan, uh, went to Dorpat, now, uh, now Tartu, where he studied and, and learned about these things. So in, within empires, there, there was develop of nations. And most importantly, this occurred in the Soviet Union. Now here's one of the great ironies of history. The Soviet Union was made by Marxists. Marxists are generally anti-nationalist. They pride themselves on being internationalists. And yet the Soviet Union became what I would call the crucible of nations, the cradle of nations, both old and new. When I was your age, I was once your age, it was another century, but I was, I was. And, and when I was your age, I remember that the dominant discourse in Sovietology about uh, the Soviet Union and nationality and nationhood was that it was a russifying empire and it was repressive of national cultures. And it was a very powerful view and people like Robert Conquest and other conservative and right-wing historians would argue Russia, Soviet Union was the prison house of nations. It's a phrase that Marx or Engels used to describe Tsarist Russia. And when I got here in, imagine this, I first came to the Soviet Union in 1964 and studied it for my dissertation in 65, 66. When I first came here, I, I went to Armenia and Georgia and I see national republics. <laughs> in which people are speaking Armenian, speaking Georgian, uh, and developing national cultures with national films, national operas, etc. Something's wrong with this, this Western picture. In fact, the Bolsheviks, that is Lenin's party that came to power in October 1917, had a very firm view that though they were against nationalism, they were living in a certain stage of history. This was still capitalism and bourgeois dominance, etc., and that in this stage, it would be necessary to develop nations up to a point. Uh, and then nationalism could be overcome. That nationalism itself was a product of 
imperialism. And if the Russians could only show the other peoples now in the Soviet Union that we're not imperialists, we're going to help you develop your nations. We have our own socialist uh, mission civilisatrice to develop you as nations. They will not become nationalists. They will join us as fraternal brothers and sisters in the making of a socialist uh, country. All right? That was Lenin's view. Lenin even argued the countries can leave if they want. They can leave. And separation was put into the constitutions, all the constitutions. They were free to leave if they want. They weren't actually free. Shh, don't, that didn't quite work that way. But, but they, at least officially they were. A kind of time bomb, as Putin put it, was in the constitution of the Soviet Union. And if the center ever weakened, they would go off on their own uh, now that you've developed them, right? So the, the Soviet Union then became a, a, a multinational state a pseudo-federation in which all real sovereign power was in the center, was in Moscow. But on, in the republics and among other nationalities be, below the republics, their own national cultures would develop. They would have operas and local peoples would, would govern, etc. Right. So the Soviet Union is a very interesting, complex, and contradictory state, which has all kinds of repressive aspects to it, of course. We have Stalin and Stalinism, in which certain degrees of Sovietization, which can be translated as Russification, occur, right? Particularly in places like Ukraine or the Baltic Republics or Belarus, but also in which, contradictorily, national development is also taking places like as in the Caucasus most particularly, all right? So this is a very peculiar empire one of our students from Chicago, Terry Martin, calls it an affirmative action empire in which the local peoples were encouraged to develop their cultures within limits, right? Within Soviet limits. That is, you don't criticize the state, the Communist Party, uh, and so forth. And you can be patriotic, love your country, but you can't be nationalistic and say we're better than Armenians are better than Georgians. So Armenians didn't say that, they just knew it was true. So this was the nature of the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union uh, also helped develop new countries that had never existed as nations before, most particularly Azerbaijan uh, and Central Asia, the Muslim republics of Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, uh, uh, and, and where I left one out, I think Kazakhstan, whatever, five of them out there. So that's, that's an extraordinarily important story that, that, that happened. Now, there's a dilemma of empires. How are we doing on time? A little bit more, 15 minutes? Or something? Yeah. So there's a kind of dilemma of empire. What if you, as the British in India, or you, as the Communist Party dominating the Soviet Union, actually succeed in your mission civilisatrice? What if you actually develop people, educate Gandhi, educate hundreds of millions of intellectuals and people? The Soviet Union was, was, a, was a project of literacy and educating people. I mean, raising them up, making them urban. Soviet Union was a country that went from 80% peasant in 1917 to 80% urban by the time it destructed. This is an enormous modernization. What if you make all those people modern and conscious and national even? What if your mission civilization succeeds? Who needs the empire anymore? Why can't you govern yourself? So you can argue, as everybody seems to do, that the Soviet Union was a failure, that it collapsed because it couldn't work. Or you can argue it was too successful in creating nations, creating an educated population, creating urban people who could then, who no longer needed the patronage, the tutelage, the paternalism of a communist party. They could go off and do their own thing, at least for a while, and then a new authoritarianism ultimately developed. So that's, a, in very large scale, that's the, that's the tale then of the development of nations within the Soviet Union. Now, as I argued before, Russia itself 
and the Soviet Union had difficulties with finding a coherent, conscious national identity. The Soviet Union may have inspired to become something like a nation state, but given the differences between peoples and social groups, horizontally and vertically within it, it failed to create a completely coherent and stable ide collective identity of the Soviet Union. Now, don't exaggerate. There was something called Soviet patriotism, and people would fight against the Nazi invasion. Let's not forget who won the Second World War in Europe. The Soviets faced three quarters of the Nazi forces. They lost 27 million people. They took Berlin. What country liberated Auschwitz and de facto ended the Holocaust? The Red Army, the Soviet Union. These are not things that in general are taught in the United States because we always have a very negative view of the Soviet Union for perfectly understandable reasons. We identify what happens in the Soviet Union with Stalinism, the Great Purges, and the Gulag. And there's a huge industry developed on those things and not on other things or Soviet suffering or achievements or whatever. After all, we are in a rivalry with the, the Soviet Union and with Russia today. So a different view uh, there uh, uh, is, is possible. And the same with Russia. So Russia is today largely often, too often in the West, particularly in the United States, identified with a single person, Putin, who is, of course, a former KGB agent, right? And, and the complexities of the present Russian uh, society and state are largely uh, uh, obliterated in that kind of simplified view uh, of the present day uh, country. So in general, I'm arguing then that the Soviet Union, like Tsarist Russia, failed to develop a very coherent, conscious, and consistent, stable national identity. Indeed, after the fall of the Soviet Union, um, there, there, there was a, an effort by the Yeltsin regime in the 1990s to develop a national identity. And they searched and searched and searched, and eventually they concluded that our national identity is the search for finding our national identity. They never actually found one. Now, if you notice, under Putin, who's now ruled for over 20 years, coming to power uh, at the beginning of this century, basically elected president in the year 2000, uh, they've also made efforts to create some kind of of national identity. In, it's, it's good to remember that in Putin's early years, uh, he was much more mild and much more interested in relations with the West. You remember during, in 2001, uh, during the, the attack on, the, on uh, the World Trade Center, etc., uh, it was the Soviet Union, uh, it was Ru Putin's Russia who first made gestures toward the United States, we'll come to your aid, and they let us use bases or encourage Central Asian countries to use bases to help with our war in Afghanistan. But that changed over time, maybe roughly around 2007, often dated to the famous or infamous speech that he gave at the Munich Security Conference that February, in which he began to talk about the uniqueness of Russia, the need to stand up to a global hegemon, the United States, and to allow other countries to develop in their own way and by implication create regional hegemonies in different parts of the world. And so a struggle has developed between this view of unipolarity and American dominance uh, in the world and regional hegemonies of different countries in different areas, perhaps uh, Iran in the Middle East and China in the South China Sea uh, and in East Asia and Russia in the former Soviet Union and so forth. So this is something that's going on at the present time. And for Putin, with his uh, turn after 2007, Russia became, at least they, the government attempted to generate a more nationalistic, a more conservative, and even an anti-Western 
kind of national identity based on the uniqueness of, of, Europe, of, of Russian civilization. Now, if you actually examine in detail those efforts, they're highly contradictory. They're elements of, uh, of Eurasianism, of that somehow we're connected to a some kind of imaginary civilization of Eurasia. Uh, there are very conservative elements in that um, uh, ideology at the, at the present moment uh, with, um, uh, uh, with anti-gay uh, 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 and uh, uh, other kinds of efforts uh, to, to challenge the traditional solidity of the family. There's a kind of international, a new international of right-wing regimes of which Putin's government is part. So there's, it's still very contradictory. And if you think of the present moment and the invasion uh, in uh, February of last year of Ukraine, you can sort of pick out the contradictory elements in his own rhetoric and in the practice of, of uh, the Russian government. Think about what occurred last year. First of all, Putin developed a view of history that argued that Ukrainians, Belarusians, and great Russians, as they're called, Russian Russians, are one people, Adin Narod. This is a kind of old idea that goes back to conservatives and even liberals, by the way, in the Russian Empire. You can find it in Kluchevsky, not a right-wing figure. You can find it in Mikhail Katkov, a right-wing figure in the 19th century. And this idea that, you, that, that, as I understand what Putin is saying, is that these peoples, particularly Ukrainians and Russians, ought to live in harmony together. But something's wrong. The West is moving in, and, this, and then he completely manufactures an element in order to make this make sense. Neo-Nazis have taken over the Ukrainian state. I doubt that anyone in the government seriously believes that. There's a lot of propaganda based on that, but it's, it's, it's a far-fetched view uh, that Zelensky somehow is a, is a neo-fascist and so forth. But you needed that element and the raising of the specter of Bandera and other right-wingers in order to make this weird idea that somehow, yes, we're all brothers and we're gonna come and liberate you Indeed, we're gonna mostly kill people who speak Russian in Ukraine while we're invading because it's, they all live along that border. Uh, this strange, bizarre policy uh, and so forth. And Putin has raised the specter of all kinds of, of historical fantasies that they're going to create uh, or take over those parts of Russia which were fought for and won by Catherine the Great, so-called uh, Novorossiya or no Novorossiya. Uh, and of course, Crimea, it goes without saying, is Russian uh, in, in their view as well. So this is a very mixed and complex uh, uh, view. And I find it, and I'd love to hear what Anatoly and others will say in the future, I find it impossible to believe that they believe it. But if you go back to what I said at the very beginning of the lecture, that people have, if that national interests are not objective and fixed in stone but are always determined by subjective understandings of who we are and who others are and where our threats come from. And remember, threats are always perceptions. I'm not afraid of any of you. I don't perceive anything. I don't know about Michael. But, but in general, you know, you perceive threats, right? And, and so Putin and his cronies are in the Kremlin perceived a potential future threat from a Western-oriented Ukraine. And therefore, he launched in February 24th of last year a preemptive strike against Ukraine. Not because Ukraine was a, an immediate danger. It wasn't. There's no danger from Ukraine in the immediate. But a future threat was there. And the promises of the West, the reckless promises of the West, that Ukraine could join NATO uh, was something that, of course, triggered the worst fears and American diplomats, including the current uh, head of the CIA, William Burns, had noted this to, to American governments. Uh, that was a red line that could not be crossed. Um, so 
what Putin saw, and I think in some ways accurately, was Ukraine is not in NATO, but NATO is already in Ukraine, and we have to stop that. So the, the, the invasion is both a kind of realpolitik move to stop NATO expansion, and it's closed in a kind of ideological discursive understanding of threats and, and uh, future anticipations of what might be the weakening of Russia, the need to prevent that from happening, uh, that then constituted uh, this, this war. So that in very brief <laughs> time was my idea of how Russia might conceive of itself, how a certain weakness of national identity, a sense of vulnerability vis-a-vis -vis the West in particular, uh, helped generate uh, the, this tragedy, this blunder, this nikamuni nuzhna vaina, and this war, on, oh, you all know Russian, uh, uh, this war ne needed by no one uh, to come about. So on that, I will thank you for your attention.